Climate Change and the Shipping Response. This module aims to provide an overview of air emissions and climate change issues, as well as the international response and frameworks. The module also deals with international shipping response. It highlights the past and ongoing international maritime organization activities and the wider industry. This includes all the relevant debates leading to the adoption and implementation of Chapter 4 of the International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, 1973, as modified by the Protocol of 1978, MARPOL 7378, Annex 6. Upon completion of this module, you should be able to differentiate between the concept of air pollution and climate change, identify the origins and issues related to air pollution and climate change, describe the concept of climate change, its impacts, and identify various types of GHG emissions, describe the international response to the problem, the global framework and main bodies and organizations who are involved in tackling climate change, and their overall responsibilities. Explain IMO's structure and the general working practices with regard to environmental protection. Identify the main IMO activities and studies and describe the historical developments that led to the adoption of Chapter 4 of MARPOL Annex 6. Explain the current IMO regulatory framework. Describe the current debates on further energy efficiency measures and technical cooperation and technology transfer and progress so far. And name typical IMO activities for the promotion of ratification and implementation of MARPOL Annex 6, specifically those related to energy efficiency and GHG control. Overview. A number of topics are covered. These include the origins of air pollution, air pole, and the impact on climate change, the international global response, the international shipping response, the main IMO instruments and historical developments. Air emissions have emerged as a serious concern in the past few decades due to the impact on human health and the wider ecosystem, including land and sea. Generally, the air quality, air pollution became an issue for regulators when the following happened. Air emissions impacted on public health. Air emissions had visible effects on the environment, sea, land and agriculture. Air pollution was highlighted by the scientific community. Therefore, the disturbances to human well-being and their living environment and civil scientific activities formed the first step to recognizing pollutants as a serious issue. The visibility factor associated with social acceptance explains why some pollutants were regulated before others, for example, oil pollution and garbage. In this respect, air pollution faces a clear lack of actual visibility. For this simple reason, in the shipping industry, the regulation for air pollution was delayed due to more obvious aspects, such as water pollution. To best address air emission problems, it is important to distinguish between air pollutants and those components that lead to climate change and or ozone holes due to alteration to the Earth's atmospheric properties. Air pollutants are considered to be harmful substances for human beings. Generally, the impact on communities decreases with the distance from the release point. NOx, nitrogen oxide, SOx, sulfur oxides, and particulate matters, PM, are among this category. Other emissions are those that alter the constituents of the Earth's atmosphere by changes to their atmospheric concentrations. Greenhouse gases and ozone depleting substances are typical elements in this category. Generally, 
air pollutants are considered emissions with significant local impacts, while GHG emissions and ODS are considered as gases with significant global impacts. It is well established that the air contains a large variety of gas or vaporous components. Despite the overwhelming presence of oxygen and nitrogen, the atmosphere contains various gases, vapors, and aerosols. Such substances originate from natural processes or as a result of human activities. Several natural processes release chemical and particulate matters into the atmosphere. For example, volcano gas eruptions, forest fires, decaying dead animals, humans, or plants. These are referred to as naturogenic emissions. Human activities, in particular industrial activities, produce a large amount of gases and chemicals which are released into the atmosphere. In fact, all industrial activities, including transport, produce such emissions. These are man-made emissions and normally referred to as anthropogenic emissions. Some of the substances present in the atmosphere remain physiologically and chemically inert, but others may affect human health, animals and plants. However, most air emissions will have global environmental impacts by affecting the properties of the atmosphere. The world's industrial developments and the corresponding transport system growth were based and still are on energy sources almost exclusively derived from fossil fuels. The massive extraction and combustion of fossil fuels, in combination with the release of related exhaust emissions, caused not only air quality issues, but also led to evidence of climate change and global warming. Cities were first affected by air pollution. The vicinity of industries in urban areas amplified the issue of air quality. The undeniable impacts of air pollutants triggered a regulatory response from the 1970s. This process aimed to mitigate the issue, raise awareness among the public, and enhance research on the control of air pollution. Thus, through its deadly aspects, the air emissions and in particular its polluting aspects acquired social visibility. The amount of pollutants emitted in the air became so large that their consequences could not be ignored, either locally or globally. The issue of global warming linked to GHG emissions is also mainly linked to the use of fossil fuels. This has received significant attention from 1992 when the first Earth Summit on the subject was organized in Rio. In 2007, the world accepted expert body, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, said the following. The warming of the climate system is unequivocal, as is now evident from observations of increases in global average air and ocean temperatures, widespread melting of snow and ice, and rising global average sea levels. Recognizing its impacts, it was decided that the changes to the Earth's atmosphere properties need to be addressed and limited as much as possible in order to keep a balanced environment for human societies. As this is a global problem, the response has to be international. Before introducing the international response to climate change, we need to highlight the role that fossil fuels, combustion principles and their usage play in global warming. Fuel combustion produces energy, but also generates a certain number of byproducts in the form of exhaust emissions. Fossil fuels were created millions of years ago, most certainly from the compression and chemistry occurring inside layers of organic matter accumulated and recovered. Because of their origin, fossil fuels contain high levels of carbon. Coal usually contains up to 95% of carbon, an average of 90%, the rest being hydrogen, water, and ash. 
Crude oil demonstrates a proportion of carbon around 82 to 87%, an average of about 84% by weight. While coal is predominantly made of carbon, crude oil is a complex mix of hydrocarbons. In addition to carbon and hydrogen, crude oil and coals may hold a large variety of chemical compounds trapped in their structures. For example, coals contain mainly carbon, but also sulfur and many other noxious matters. An average crude oil contains about 84% carbon, 14% hydrogen, 1 to 3% sulfur, and less than 1% each of nitrogen, oxygen, metal, and salts. Following experimentation during the 17th and 18th century, the steam engine became operational on ships within the 19th century. Coal was the first fuel used to generate steam in order to activate paddles and propellers. Turbine engines were introduced later. Coal produced thick smoke and energy efficiency of steam systems remained low. These drawbacks fostered the use of oil and encouraged technical innovation and particularly the modification that led to wider use of diesel engines on board ships. These are much more efficient than steam plants. The first diesel ocean-going ship, the MV Zelandia, was launched in 1912. The novelty was the direct use of the energy of combustion without passing through steam systems. A move from the so-called external combustion systems to internal combustion engines, as shown in the diagram. The efficiency of the internal combustion engine, in particular diesel engines, is higher than that of external combustion engines. It was due to this high efficiency and economic advantage that after the oil crisis of 1973 and the rise of oil prices, diesel engines dominated the shipping industry as much as 99%. However, some narrow sectors of the industry, about 1%, still rely on other kinds of heat engines such as steam turbines and gas turbines. Such uses, including use of nuclear energy in shipping, are for operational functional reasons, in particular in Navy applications. Figure 8.1 is from the second IMO GHG study, 2009. Emissions. Some of the emissions are absorbed by oceans and also convert partially to other chemicals and aerosols. Impacts and associated damages. Rise in temperature, changes in the sea level, ice, snow and rainfall, Soil salinity and moisture content, natural disasters. Aerosol. Technically, an aerosol is a colloid suspension of fine solid particles or liquid droplets in a gas, e.g. air pollution, that is smog and smoke. Air pollution and the issue of GHG. Air pollution, air pole, climate system, GHGE and environmental impact. Air pollution is the harmful or excessive quantities of substances introduced or emitted into the Earth's atmosphere by humans. CO2 is not a direct pollutant, but has indirect impacts through the modification of the atmospheric composition and properties. Climate system dynamics. The climate is usually defined as the average weather over long-term periods. Or, in a more scientifically accurate way, the climate can be defined as the statistical description in terms of the mean and variability of relevant quantities over a period of time. WMO website definition. So, the climate differs from the weather, which is of chaotic nature and barely predictable, or only on a short-time basis. 
A climate thus refers to an average image of the weather over time inside which the extreme short-term events are obviously invisible. The climate is a whole system which combines numerous interactions and retroactions between various complex subsystems, the atmosphere, oceans, land, ice and snow, living creatures, including human beings and their activities. IPCC 2007. The dynamics of the Earth's climate are impacted on by the alteration of each of the following systems. The atmosphere, that is gases, the hydrosphere, i.e. the waters, the lithosphere, i.e. solid layer of Earth, the cryosphere, i.e. frozen waters, and the biosphere, i.e. the living. Greenhouse gas warming effect. The GHG emissions act as a blanket for the Earth, leading to warming of the planet. The existence of GHG in the stratosphere is highly valuable because they reflect back the energy of the infrared emitted by the Earth's surface. Without such effect, the planet would be too cold. The GHG represents a tiny fraction of the atmosphere, less than 1%. Except for purely man-made chemicals like CFCs and HFCs, GHG emissions occurring naturally and from natural sources are present in the atmosphere. The issue of GHG is not their presence in the atmosphere, but their quantity and concentrations which affect the level of temperature of the Earth's lower atmospheric layers. Ideally, and to sustain human life on Earth, not too much warming and not too much cooling is desirable. GHGE and the atmosphere. To control this rise in GHGE, our fossil fueled activities need to change. Methane is a fugitive gas from LNG process and emitted from ruminants, cars, termites, ants and bioactive systems, wetland or permafrosts. Man-made GHGEs. The main GHG heat trapping gases are as follows. Carbon dioxide. According to IPCC, this has the most influence on global warming because of the quantities released and its lifetime in the atmosphere. However, as a natural compound, the carbon dioxide belongs to a large carbon circulation between land, atmosphere and oceans, in which carbon sources, or release, and carbon sinks, or capture, coexist. Methane. The main source of human-related CH4 emissions are agriculture and livestock, mining, transportation, and the use of certain fossil fuels, sewerage, oil and gas production and processing, and decomposing garbage in landfills. Methane quantities in the air are far less than the CO2, but its warming capacity is very high in spite of its short lifetime. Nitrous oxide. Industrial farming uses large quantities of fertilizers, and this accounts for the majority of the nitrous oxide release. The second position is taken by the combustion of fossil fuels. Halo carbon. They are non-natural but manufactured compounds. They are extensively used as refrigerants but may be found in other industrial processes as well. In spite of the very low concentration in the air, their radiative forcing effect is important and they may remain active for a very long time. The international response, rationale, various steps. Various global institutions under different mandates have started the conversation to combat climate change. The following slides provide some genesis and rationale behind some of the establishment's legal frameworks and aspirations. United Nations Environmental Programme, UNEP, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, 
UNFCCC, Kyoto Protocol, Vienna Convention and Montreal Protocol on Ozone Depleting Substances, IMO for International Shipping, United Nations Environmental Programme. Another important outcome of the UNCHE was the creation of the United Nations Environment Programme, or UNEP. Their mandate is to coordinate the global response to establish and emerging environmental challenges. The need for such an organisation is clearly expressed in the UN Resolution 2997. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC. The IPCC was created under the auspices of the UNEP and the WMO, or World Meteorological Organization. The IPCC was endorsed by the UN in 1988. Its mission is to review the state of knowledge in the science of climate change, carry out studies on the social and economic impact of climate change, including global warming, propose possible response strategies to delay limit or mitigate the impact of adverse climate change, act as a major knowledge organization on climate change. The United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. The UNFCCC is a framework convention which aims to limit the level of climate change. It focuses on promoting cooperation on understanding and reducing the effects of human activities on climate. It adopts legislative or administrative measures against activities that are likely to have adverse effects on the climate. This instrument does not set precise objectives or targets. For targets and limits, the Kyoto Protocol was adopted later on. UNFCCC requirements. In spite of these declarations, the commitment does not require imperative GHG release reduction. The requirements imposed on states are limited to commitments, Article 4, and communication regarding implementation, Article 12. In summary, all parties have to do the following. Develop and communicate to the Conference of Parties a national inventory of anthropogenic emissions by sources and removals by sinks. Commit to develop and communicate the measures related to GHG control. Promote technology transfer and the sustainable management, conservation and enhancement of greenhouse gas sinks and reservoirs such as forests and oceans. Consider climate change in social, economic and environmental policy development. Cooperate in sciences, techniques and education, as well as exchange information related to climate change. Promote public awareness and education. The Kyoto Protocol. The Kyoto Protocol of 1997 concluded a first part of efforts to create stronger commitment for the developed countries. Annex 1 countries accepted reduction targets. Non-Annex 1 countries accepted to support the process within CBDR, or Common but Differentiated Responsibility. The Kyoto Protocol set binding emission targets for the developed countries in Annex 1. The GHG commissions are categorised as six main items. These are CO2, CH4, N2O, HFCs, PFCs and SF6. To reach their targets, countries can reduce their emission and or offset their emissions through joint implementation, clean development or emission trading. The Kyoto Protocol commitments were for up to 2012 and negotiations are now underway for post-Kyoto arrangements. Post-Kyoto The Kyoto Protocol commitments are extended to 2020. 
Currently, climate change negotiations are underway for post-Kyoto arrangements. Paris, of December 2015, may make new binding decisions for post-Kyoto. The Montreal Protocol, the prevention of ozone depletion. The Montreal Protocol is designed to protect the ozone layer by phasing out the production of substances known as ODS or ozone depleting substances. It was entered into force on January the 1st, 1989. Gases that were considered in terms of ozone depletion potential. The ODP is based on the amount of chlorine which is released by the refrigerant as it degrades. A reference ODP is for CFCR11, also known as Freon11, CFC11 or R11, which is taken as one. Most refrigerants are strong GHG emittents and thus limitation of ODS will also help climate change. Climate change impact on oceans. GHG and shipping, UNCLOS and pollution, emissions from shipping, Marpol Annex 6 and its Chapter 4. Climate change impact on oceans. The global warming and air substances absorbed by the oceans deeply affect their health. Ecosystems and habitats are disturbed by the modification of the ocean properties with the absorbing of air emitted compounds and global warming. Another consequence of the warming is the ocean dilatation and sea level rise, which endangers the coastal ecosystems and accelerates erosion. In addition, the carbon dioxide, combined with other atmospheric compounds, possesses another important aspect, ocean acidification. As part of the natural carbon cycle, oceans absorb carbon dioxide. While the CO2 increases in the air, its amount dissolved in the oceans increases. In the seawater, CO2 reacts with H2O and forms carbonic acid, and the overall acidification process of the ocean begins. The present rate of increase in ocean acidification has no precedent over the last 30 million years. The high speed acidification may impair the ability of many organisms to cope with changing oceanic properties. The world fleet evolution from 1914 to 2007. Around 90% of world trade is carried by the international shipping industry. Without shipping, the import and export of goods for a modern and globalized world would not be possible. International shipping trade continues to expand, bringing benefits for producers and consumers across the world through competitive freight costs. There are over 50,000 merchant ships trading internationally, transporting every kind of cargo. The world fleet has continued to increase in terms of number and tonnage. An IMO GHG study of 2014 predicted a 50 to 250% increase by 2050. While shipping in comparison to other transport modes is the most efficient mode of cargo transport and was considered environmentally friendly, the significant growth of seaborne trade and its externalities and societal costs have modified this perception. The growth of transportation by ships increase the energy consumed by shipping and, in spite of the improvement in the energy efficiency of ship engines, global shipping emissions amplified quantitatively. This number and volume growth not only have implications for oceans as sea routes, but also affect air quality in port areas and coastal zones. The United Nations Convention of the Law of the Seas International shipping is ruled by a set of international legal and regulatory frameworks. Such regulatory frameworks 
focus on understanding the impact of shipping on climate change and the various provisions developed through the IMO to address the issue. The marine-related international regulations to address the consequences of air emissions can be found in the UN CLOs and in the IMO MARPOL regulations. The UN CLO regulations form the basis of the international law regulating the seas, while the IMO specifically regulates international shipping. Both of these develop comprehensive regulatory regimes to be enforced by states. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas possesses extensive references to the protection of the environment. In its preamble, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas states that it is important to do the following. Promote the peaceful uses of the seas and oceans, the equitable and efficient utilization of their resources, the conservation of their living resources, and the study, protection, and preservation of the marine environment. The United Nations Convention Law of the Seas demonstrates the importance of protecting the environment and developing proper enforcement mechanisms, which can be materialized through certification and inspection regimes. United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas proclaims that it is the duty of the state to protect the environment and the state's responsibility not to harm others. The measures developed should not transfer the damage or risks. The global and regional cooperation are paramount in environmental protection. That the risks and effects of pollution must be assessed scientifically. That air pollution is an established concern. That compliance monitoring and enforcement systems have to be developed to verify and ensure compliance. IMO Energy Efficiency Regulation. In 1948, a United Nations body in charge of maritime affairs was created. The International Maritime Organization, or IMO, acquired its final name in 1982. The IMO presently consists of the following. An assembly, a council, a number of committees, and a secretariat. Aims of the IMO are summarized in Article 1 of its Constitutive Convention. They are as follows. A. To provide machinery for cooperation among governments in the field of governmental regulation and practices relating to technical matters of all kinds that affect shipping engaged in international trade to encourage and facilitate the general adoption of the highest practicable standards in matters concerning maritime safety, efficiency of navigation, and prevention and control of marine pollution from ships, and to deal with administrative and legal matters related to the purposes set out in this article. B, to encourage the removal of discriminatory action and unnecessary restrictions by governments that affect shipping engaged in international trade so as to promote the availability of shipping services to the commerce of the world without discrimination. Assistance and encouragement given by a government for the development of its national shipping and for purposes of security does not in itself constitute discrimination, provided that such assistance and encouragement is not based on measures designed to restrict the freedom of shipping of all flags to take part in international trade. C. To provide for the consideration by the organization of matters concerning unfair restrictive practices by shipping concerns in accordance with part two. D. To provide for the consideration by the organization of any matters concerning shipping and the effect of shipping on the marine environment that may be referred to by any organ or specialized agency of the United Nations. E, to provide for the exchange of information among governments on matters under consideration 
by the organisation. For environmental purposes, the IMO has to support the enforcement of the highest practical standards, as well as maintain a close link with other UN bodies on such matters. The IMO provides the governing tools and policies, but implementation and enforcement of IMO tools lies in the hands of the member states and their governments. The IMO's role is thus primarily to adopt legislation while enforcement lies with the contracting governments. Since 1959, the IMO has proactively taken responsibility for issues related to pollution by shipping. The organization supports the development of regulations that aim to prevent pollution to the marine environment and addresses the introduction of technologies and specifics as defined by the Articles of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas. Article 1, number 4 states that pollution of the marine environment means the introduction by man, directly or indirectly, of substances or energy into the marine environment, including estuary, which results or is likely to result in such deleterious effects as harm to living resources and marine life, hazards to human health, hindrance to marine activities, including fishing and other legitimate uses of the sea, impairment of quality for the use of seawater, and the reduction of amenities. Article 196 notes, states should take all measures necessary to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of the marine environment that result from the use of technologies under their jurisdictional control or the intentional or in accidental introduction of species, alien or new, to a particular part of the marine environment, which may cause significant and harmful changes thereto. The Maritime Environment Protection Committee is the IMO committee in charge of addressing the environmental issues for the IMO. This committee is supported by subcommittees, sometimes shared with the Maritime Safety Committee. Additionally, the MEPC sets up working groups that deal with various items on its agenda, such as ballast water, air pollution, GHG emissions, and so forth. The committees and their working groups are supported by the IMO Secretariat that deals with all related administrative aspects. The International Convention for the Prevention of Pollution from Ships, or MAPO, is the main international convention that covers the prevention of pollution of the marine environment by ships. It was adopted on the 2nd of November 1973 at IMO and subsequently amended by its protocol in 1978. The combined instrument entered into force on the 2nd of October 1983. The convention includes Regulations aimed at preventing and minimizing pollution from ships, both accidental pollution and that from routine operations, and includes six technical annexes. Annex 1. Regulations for the prevention of pollution by oil. Entered into force on the 2nd of October 1983. This annex covers the prevention of pollution by oil from operational measures as well as from accidental discharges. The 1992 amendments to Annex 1 made it mandatory for new oil tankers to have double hulls and brought in a phase-in schedule for existing tankers to fit double hulls. Annex 2, regulations for control of pollution by noxious liquid substances in bulk. This was entered into force on the 2nd of October, 1983. This annex, details the discharge criteria and the measures for the control of pollution by noxious liquid substances that are carried in bulk. Some 250 substances were evaluated and included in the list appended to the convention. The discharge of the residue is allowed only to reception facilities in certain concentrations and conditions. An extreme is the prevention of pollution by harmful substances 
carried by sea in package form. This was entered into force on the 1st of July, 1992. This annex contains general requirements for the issuing of detailed standards on packing, marking, labeling, documentation, stowage, quantity limitations, exceptions and notifications. For the purpose of this annex, the harmful substances are fully defined. Annex 4, the prevention of pollution by sewage from ships. This was entered into force on the 27th of September 2003. This annex contains requirements to control pollution of the sea by sewage, the prohibition of discharge of sewage into the sea, an improved sewage treatment plant and so forth. With lots of details from the subject. Annex 5, Prevention of Pollution by Garbage from Ships. This was entered into force on the 31st of December, 1988. This annex deals with different types of garbage and specifies the distances from land and the manner in which they may be disposed of. The most important feature of this annex is the complete ban imposed on the disposal into the sea of all forms of plastic. Annex 6, the prevention of air pollution from ships. This was entered into force on the 19th of May 2005. This annex sets limits of sulfur oxide and nitrogen oxide emissions from ship exhausts and prohibits the deliberate emissions of ozone deleting substances. The annex sets designated emission control areas with more stringent standards for sulfur oxide and nitrogen oxide. A new chapter adopted in 2011 covers mandatory technical and operational energy efficiency measures aimed at reducing GHG emissions from ships. A state that becomes party to MARPOL must ratify MARPOL Annexes 1 and 2. The rest of the annexes are voluntary insofar as membership to MARPOL Convention is concerned. MARPOL Annex 6 MARPOL Annex 6 is the latest part that has been added to the MARPOL Convention in 1997 and entered into force in 2005. Major modifications and amendments to MARPOL Annex 6 occurred in 2008 on Nitrogen Oxide Technical Code and 2011 with the insertion of a new Chapter 4 that deals with energy efficiency regulations for ships effectively dealing with GHG emissions. Therefore today, Annex 6 encompasses air pollutants and GHG emissions combined. The regulations also include elements like bunker fuels, incinerators, reception facilities, emission control areas, ozone depleting substances, and so forth. The scope of MIPOL Annex 6 is depicted in the diagram in the next slide. MARPOL Annex 6 Scope The diagram above illustrates the regulatory scope of Annex 6. MARPOL Annex 6 Chapter 4 IMO Framework Chapter 4 Regulation on Energy Efficiency for Ships This Chapter 4 was developed to regulate energy efficiency of ships. It came into force in January 2013. In this chapter, the following regulations are specified. Regulation 19, Application. This regulation specifies the application domain and the scope of the Chapter 4 regulations. Regulation 20, Attained Energy Efficiency Design Index, Attained EEDI. This regulation specifies the requirements on attained EEDI, including the calculation processes and survey and verification aspects. Regulation 21, required EEDI. This regulation deals with the required EEDI, its calculation using reference lines and reduction factors, and its calculation processes. Regulation 21.5, also makes provision that the EEDI must not impair the safe maneuverability of the ships. Regulation 22, Ship Energy Efficiency Management Plan, or SEEMP, 
This regulation specifies the requirement for ships to have an SEEMP on board and how the SEEMP should be developed. Regulation 23. The promotion of technical cooperation and transfer of technology relating to the improvement of energy efficiency of ships. This regulation emphasizes the importance of enhancing technical cooperation and transfer of technology to support energy efficiency improvements in the world fleet, in particular for the benefit of developing countries. A full description of Chapter 4 and supporting guidelines and processes are given in Module 2, Marple Annex 6, Prevention of Air Pollution from Ships. IMO Major Studies As an outcome of the 1997 Marpole Conference, the decision to study CO2 emission from ships led to the launching of a complete study on this topic. Released in 2000, the first study constituted the initial step of deliberations about the development of new rules to address GHG controls in shipping. The study, using data from 1996, estimated that ships emitted about 420 million tonnes of CO2 per year and thereby contributed about 1.8% of the world's total anthropogenic CO2 emissions in that year. The study also stated that technical and operational measures have a limited potential for contributing to reduced emissions from ships if the increase in demand for shipping services, as well as market requirements for increased speed and availability are to continue. The main outputs of the study were as follows. One, shipping is considered an efficient means of transportation compared to others. Two, it is difficult to assess with accuracy the overall impact of shipping because of discrepancies in data concerning bunker figures and uncertainties in the fuel consumption models. The impact of air emission should include nitrogen oxide, sulfur oxide and GHG emissions. Significant reduction of GHG emission can be achieved through operational and technical measures. However, the increase in demand for shipping services may impede operational and technical savings. Environmental indexing, market-based mechanisms and design standards may be appropriate measures to implement in the future. In spite of its relevance, no immediate regulations followed after the presentation of this study. The lengthy discussion of the IMO involvement and approach to climate change necessitated an updated study. The second IMO GHG study, 2009. The second IMO GHG study was commissioned in 2007 and delivered in 2009. The study updated the GHG emission figures for shipping and estimated the potential for the reduction of emission according to the implementation of different technologies and operational energy efficiency measures. In addition, cost effectiveness and policy evaluation options were considered. The second study initiated a proposed framework to support the regulatory decision-making process. Presented during the Copenhagen UNFCCC's COP discussions on climate change in December 2009, the second IMO GHG study of 2009 forms the scientific background for the present IMO policy and the regulatory frameworks that were developed soon thereafter. The intention of the document was to provide solid research-based data and information to the shipping community in order to help them for regulatory decision-making. Among various types of GHG emissions, the GHG emissions from shipping are overwhelmingly dominated by CO2. Thus, CO2 is established as the main GHG concern for shipping that should be the subject of future regulations. 
All other GHG emissions by international shipping are considered as negligible. In spite of large variations and uncertainties in emission assessments, a range of efficiency is determined for sea, air, road and rail transportation. As compared with other transportation modes, GHGEs are low even when compared to rail, but not to pipelines. Other points to note are that energy efficiency is presently linked to size, that shipping is the best mode of cargo transport. In comparison with other sectors, shipping represents only 3.3%, but it has a great growth potential in the future predicted to increase by 50 to 250 per cent by 2050. The second IMO GHD study of 2009 discusses policy options that include technical, operational and market oriented approaches. Among the several policies detailed in the second IMO GHD study of 2009, Three groups of policies are intensively discussed at the IMO. The technical and operational approaches focus on ships and ship management, while the economics approach seeks to achieve a global reduction of GHG by promoting both incentives and penalties. The table and list items are classified into two categories, design and operation. The focus is on the operational part which is the aim of this course. In terms of operation, the responsibility rests with fleet or ship owner management. The highest savings in operation lie in the fleet ship owner management area. The IMO suggests a three-pronged approach to reducing GHGEs. The three dimensions are technical, operational, economic technical and operational aspects. These aspects consider the design and the management of ships. The economic aspect focuses on creating incentives to reduce GHGEs. The technical and operational approaches are included in the new amendment to MARPOL Annex 6, Chapter 4. From an economic perspective, market-based mechanisms appear to offer promising tools to aid GHGE reduction. However, these are still under discussion or have been deferred and are outside of the IMO process. The main conclusions reached by the second IMO GHD study of 2009 include the following. One, shipping was estimated to have emitted 1046 million tonnes of CO2 in 2007 this corresponded to 3.3% of the global emissions during 2007. International shipping was estimated to have emitted 870 million tonnes, or about 2.7% of the global emissions of CO2 in 2007. Two, exhaust gases were the primary source of air emissions and carbon dioxide was the most important GHG emitted by ships. This was both in terms of quantity and of global warming potential. Other GHG emissions from ships were less important. Significant potential for the reduction of GHG emissions through technical and operational measures had been identified. Together, if implemented, these measures could increase efficiency and reduce emissions rate by 25 to 75% below the current levels. Many of these measures appear to be cost effective, although non-financial barriers may discourage their implementation. A number of policies to reduce GHG emissions from ships were presented as conceivable. The report analyzed options and concluded that a mandatory limit on the Energy Efficiency Design Index for new ship was a cost-effective solution that could provide an incentive to improve the design efficiency of ships. However, its environmental effect was limited because it only applied to new ships 
and because it only incentivized design improvements and not improvements in operations. Five, shipping had been shown in general to be an energy efficient means of transportation compared to other modes. If the climate was to be stabilized at no more than two degrees centigrade warming over pre-industrial levels by 2100, and emissions from shipping continued as projected in the scenarios that were given in the report, the growth of ship emissions by 200 to 300% by 2050 relative to 2007, then shipping would constitute between 12 and 18% of the global total CO2 emissions in 2050. This would then require significant effort by shipping between 2050 and 2100 to achieve the stabilization targets. MEPC 63 noted that uncertainty exists in the estimates and projections of emissions from international shipping. They agreed that further work should take place to provide the committee with reliable and up-to-date information on which to base its decisions. The third IMO GHD study of 2014 was therefore commissioned by the IMO in order to update the second IMO GHG study 2009 with the main objective of focusing on the following topics. The development of the inventories of CO2 emissions from international shipping for 2007 to 2012 Development of the inventories of other air emissions from international shipping for 2007 to 2012. Development of future shipping scenarios and projection of shipping emissions for 2012 to 2050. The study was performed in 2013 to 2014 by an international consortium with a foresight role by a steering committee. The report of the study was approved by MEPC 67 in October 2014. The estimates in the table indicate that there is an overall reduction in CO2 emissions from international shipping, both in absolute terms and as a percentage of global CO2 emissions for the period of 2007 to 2012. For the year 2012, total shipping emissions were approximately 938 million tonnes of CO2 and 961 million tonnes of CO2e, CO2 equivalent, for GHGs combining CO2, CH4 and N2O. International shipping emissions for 2012 are estimated to be 796 million tonnes of CO2 and 816 million tonnes of CO2e for total GHG emissions combining CO2, CH4 and N2O. Accordingly, international shipping accounts for approximately 2.2% and 2.1% of global CO2 and GHG emissions on a CO2 equivalent, respectively. The main engine is the primary consumer of fuel. On some ship types, auxiliary engines use a significant amount of energy. On some ship types, auxiliary boilers use a significant amount of energy. This figure indicates that container ships, bulk carriers and oil tankers dominate the international shipping CO2 emissions. All studies show that the absolute level of shipping emissions and the global share will increase in spite of the current agreed on measures. Therefore, further measures for energy efficiency are being debated. This is generally known as the data collection system that primarily aims to regulate the ship's fuel consumption measurement. Since April of 2014, IMO reached preliminary conclusions on a general description of such a global data collection system. 
The draft developed data collection system identifies three core elements. These are one, data collection by ships, two, flag state functions in relation to data collected, including verification, and three, the establishment of a centralized database by the IMO. As it stands in 2016, the following features have to some extent been agreed on. Applicable to ships of gross tonnage more than 5,000 GT, annual reporting, IMO number for ship identification, confidentiality of data such as transport work will be observed, Guidelines will be developed to deal with various details of data collection and verification activities. The registered owner will be responsible for submission of data to the administration. The administration will be responsible for verification. This can be delegated to recognised organisations. A statement of compliance will be issued by the administration to each ship annually. This work is still in progress. Thank you. This slide completes the current module.